Chapter 28 Through the sensory conduits of his command seat aboard the Null Sphere, an artificer watched his people die. A moment before, hundreds of thousands of Thran and their allies had filled the desert below. Now, only their ghosts remained, a wide ring of white cloud. The Null Sphere drew their ghosts upward and channeled the power into Phyrexia. Yamoth not only slew the Thran, he feasted on them. There was a way to stop him, though. The old man and his artificer colleagues would have to sacrifice their lives, but at least Yamoth would be stopped. Take us higher, the old man said breathlessly. He turned his head toward the Phyrexian that controlled the Null Sphere's altitude. The beast glowered at his Power Stone console. Any higher, and you humans will die of asphyxia. This low, we cannot draw mana from the white cloud, the old man lied. The city will be engulfed. The Phyrexian hesitated. Now, or all is lost. The Null Sphere soared suddenly heavenward. The old man felt himself black out. He knew he was dying. The others would die too. Their corpses would short out the command seats, and the Null Sphere would be nullified. It would no longer draw off the rolling mana below. Dying, they would trap Yamoth in his killing clouds. Death was sweeter than he could ever have hoped. It was beautiful. Halcyon floated high and safe above the roiling mana. White clouds. Pure clouds. Scouring, cleansing clouds. The rebellion was over. The Thran Alliance was only a memory. Not even their bodies would remain on the desert. Not even the desert would remain, but scoured bedrock. Yamoth lifted the wine bottle. He turned the green glass speculatively before him. The last drop of wine wormed along the base of the bottle. It was blood red, but seemed black within the glass. There were nine more bombs aboard Wrath. The crew had orders to drop one in the heart of each city-state that did not surrender unconditionally. One for each city-state, and one for Yamoth. After the Empire was brought to heal, there would be nine more bombs, one for each of the allied races, and one for Yamoth. There would be more bombs for the multiverse, nine and nine times nine and nine to the ninth power. It all began here, in this heavenly city, among the purgative clouds. Yamoth dangled the bottle over the rail and casually let it drop. He watched as it plunged, tumbling toward the clouds. Wine bled from the neck of the thing. Even before the bottle disappeared, it began to dissolve in the acid air. For the first time since the bombing had begun, Yamoth rose from his seat beside the rail. The desert was purged, but there were still Thran soldiers overrunning the city above. It would be a fight in the streets, and houses, and rooms of the city. It would be like the Thytic riots. Vengeance could menace from the skies, but do little more than that. Yamoth's place was in the fight, not above it. For the first time since the bombing had begun, Yamoth gave an order. Fly over the city, over the granary. Since the days of the riots, those granaries had harbored rebels. Vengeance toppled the bleeding walls and approached the jumble of silos and storehouses. Figures swarmed the white cylinders. Cat people, lizard men, dwarves, elves, roaches, silverfish, earwigs, flies. He could fumigate the city. Yamoth could slay them all with a thought, and that fact comforted him. Phyrexian and Halcyte guards fought the swarming Thran in alleys and doorways. Even if I lose all Halcyon, I still have Phyrexia. Vengeance knows about the silos of the granary. Drop the bow anchor. The rattle of chain came and the anchor plunged. Its crown smashed a dwarf too stoic to leap aside. Yama swung over the rail, climbed down the chain, and stepped from the anchor. His feet gory. The image made him smile. He was stomping a new vintage in blood. Yamoth drew his sword. The power stone in its hilt winked conspiratorially toward its master. He flung out the blade and easily cut a charging elf in two. Race anchor, he shouted. Even as the ring lurched upward on the chain, Yamoth seized a lizard man and flung him down, impaling him on the anchor. The flute jutted through his scaly back. Impaled alive, the Fayashino writhed on the rising anchor. Patrol the city, Yamoth ordered vengeance. He turned eager to kill again. There is a ship up there, Rebecca said, peering through the sewer gate. A war caravel. In the fetid murk of the sewer, six sets of goblin eyes grew wide. The healing capsule they bore between them glimmered beneath the smudges and grimes that draped it. A goblin muttered, Phyrexian or Thran? Rebecca said, What does it matter? The battle is thick here. We can't emerge safely. Her point was punctuated by a roaring scream. A minotaur tumbled into the culvert and pitched against the grate, or half a minotaur. Gore and innards made a gruesome cascade at Rebecca's feet. Greenery always safe before, the goblin said. Well, it's not safe now, Rebecca replied. Yamoth knows about it. He's been inside my mind. We'll have to reach the temple another way, farther up. The goblins nodded in the murk. They preferred underground passage anyway. Not that they were without their dangers, inescapable cesspools, deadfalls, rats, disease, but better these dangers than sores through the back. 
Goblin feet pattered through the trickling sludge. Rebecca followed. I shouldn't lead us any longer. Yawad knows everything I know. He knows everything I would do, would try. One of you should take over. How close can you get us to the temple? A fancy grin shone in the murk. I know the way. I bring you up Council Hall Dungus. Rebecca laughed. Good. You do that. Bring us beside the Council Hall. We'll have to fight our way to the top of the dome. We not fight. We fly. We take flying chair. She was about to object. Yamath would expect her to object. Yes, you are right. We will take a sedan chair. When we are all in the temple, we will fly away from here. We'll fly away from the war. And the horror of it all, we'll fly into the heavens. You lead on. Up to Dungus. Into heaven. The temple was crammed with refugees. Two thousand of them. More arrived every moment. They clustered thickly on the council hall dome. They leapt to the packed portico. They pressed shoulder to shoulder in the main hall. Children perched on shoulders to keep from being crushed. Every balcony was full. Every spiral stair. Folks sat atop any flat spot. Even the altar was piled high. Only the control stone itself was empty. They all knew that to climb atop it could send the whole temple crashing down. As the night wore on, more came and more. The floors filled up. Silence gave way to whispers. When morning dawned, the once gleaming temple was opaque with packed bodies. There was no hiding now. There was only a fearful question. Who would arrive first? Rebecca or Gix? Gix. The river of refugees came to an abrupt end. Only a hundred or so remained, pushing to reach the pinnacle of the dome. Those left who could, though the entry portico was already too crowded. Folk in the temple shouted them back. Still they jumped. Some gained the temple. Others fell. Their broken bodies joined the red slick on that side of the dome. The stairs turned into crimson cascade. At the rear of the line, Phyrexian guards flung down those ahead of them. Their scarlet claws hewed the backs of the folk. Bodies and blood made a gory wake behind them. They marched upward in an even and ruthless tread. All the while, their grim figures grew clear. Wide eyes, great skin, barbed whiskers, tortured muscles, horns, talons, fangs. Terror swept through the temple, borne on a single word. Phyrexians! At the head of the company was Gix himself. Take the temple! Don't let them across! shouted refugees. Don't let them across! The first talent horror easily vaulted from the dome. It clutched a trio of women. Its claws sank in. It scrambled to climb over their bleeding forms and into the temple. Shrieking in terror, the refugees behind kicked the three women off the temple. Phyrexian and women fell. A second Phyrexian leapt into the vacated space. It slew five refugees before someone stabbed it and dumped its body. Weapons were passed at the front. The next monsters who hurled themselves toward the temple plunged, swords sticking from stomachs and throats. More weapons came, but they would not be enough. The monsters were too violent, too voracious. Shift the temple! Shift it away from the pinnacle! Someone shouted. The idea swept back through the throng. Refugees on the altar clambered up beside the control stone. They set their hands on it and pushed. With a slow but implacable motion, the great temple drifted away from the pinnacle. It moved smoothly, with no more sound than a sedan chair. Gix shouted to the rest of his guards to jump. Four more Phyrexians tried. They fell and broke apart on the dome below. Gix was left to shake a bloody fist at the retreating refugees. A rabid cheer went from the temple. A sound of vengeance. The temple drifted to a halt, safely removed from the pinnacle. They would shift it back for no one except Rebecca herself. A black blot smudged out the sun. Vengeance. The war caravel slid lazily into place above the temple. Shouts of adulation died away. Surely Yawath would not bomb his own people in their temple. Nine long ropes dropped over the rails. They had not snapped straight before nine figures descended. More Phyrexians. They dropped hungrily on the heads of the crowd. This had been even more fun than this journey aboard Vengeance. Killing hundreds of thousands with white scouring clouds was beautiful. But this one-on-one -on -one dance of steel and blood, this had been fun. Yamoth had lost count of his kills. They came up very rapidly at the beginning, killing like breathing. Now the house side guard had locked down most of the granary and were cleaning out the last hidey holes. One was above, the top of a grain silo packed with a half dozen thran. A silo ladder rose up a dark shaft overhead and blood dripped from a fresh handprint on the lowest rung. It would be death to climb that ladder. A knife dropped from the shaft could sink through an eye or even a skull. There was no point in it. Yamoth stepped away from the silo, glancing up at the peak of it. A pair of house side guards stood nearby. Yamoth motioned them over. The white armored soldiers rushed to their lord. They went one knee before him and bowed their heads. How may we serve Lord Yamoth? One of them asked. Chop down this silo, Yamoth said simply. The one who had been silent now looked up at the cement structure. Chop it down, lord? Chop it down as you would chop down a tree, Yamoth said simply. 
Yes, Lord Yarmouth, the first said. With what? The other asked, quickly adding, Lord? Your power stone swords will cut stone, cut into the silent until it falls. They both nodded at that. Rising, they hurried to the silent, checked for a clear spot where the building could fall, and began chopping. Business concluded, Yamat said, walking away from the spot. He reached the street beside the granary. All on the thoroughfare, silver armor house-like guards patrolled. Red masses of meat lay in heaps on the road. Phyrexian troops crossed the street at their half-jog, eyes and claws eager for some new prey. They had run short of cat and bull and lizard flesh. Occasionally, defenders would enter a smashed tray, and Thran corpses would fly from windows and crash down into the street. On the whole, the buzz of battle was now an idle, hungry sound. The city was well in hand. The Thran soldiers below were washed away. All that remained were the traitors in the Thran temple. Yamoth stared up at the dangling gem, its heart black with treason. It was his one greatest mistake. That building, his last great mistake. The temple was Rebek's gleaming vision of heaven, which would forever war his people's mind with the true heaven of Phyrexia. Rebek had even equipped the thing to fly away. The only reason it had not was that the traitors waited for Rebek, their savior. Yamoth allowed himself a small smile. Their savior was now his. The crackle and glowing of shifting stone drew his attention away from the temple. The silo was falling. The guards had hewn out a wide gash near the foundation. The leaning weight of the tower shattered the wall. With slow majesty, the silo toppled. Its lower edge pulverized and disintegrated. The cylinder of rock cracked like an egg as it went over. The top, where Thran soldiers hid, hit last and hardest. With a thunderous crash, it fell to rubble. Amid the grinding and bouncing hunks of stone were human figures, visible for a moment before being pounded to mush. Six dead, Yama said dispassionately as he turned back toward the crowded temple. Two thousand on the verge of death. Even then, vengeance circled toward the gemstone building, a fresh company of Phyrexians ready at the ropes. It came about over the city wall. Suddenly, it was gone. A dense cloud, as white as milk, ghosted up from beyond the wall. It enveloped the war caravel in its curdling mass and continued upward. It was a killing, scouring, purifying cloud. It would turn granite to sand and sand to ash. It would obliterate flesh utterly. It would leech the charge from any power stone it contacted. Vengeance was visible once again in the vague shadow, already half eaten away and rolling over. It struck the disintegrating wall and then plunged from sight down the cliff face. No, Yomal said in disbelief. Silent and patient, the killing clouds rose on all sides of the city. Their white heads curled and edged over Halcyon. They converged in a closing dome above them all. The whole of Halcyon would be destroyed. No, Yomal said again. Worst of all, the Thran Temple and its cargo of traitors and corpses rose with sudden, terrific motion up and out of the white dome. Tongues of cloud lit the edges of the temple as it shot upward, but then it was beyond them. Two thousand traitors escaped, Yomoth breathed. Then the dome was complete. Pale death closed over Halcyon. The temple's gone, Rebek hissed within the culvert. They had just reached the upper city, just glimpsed the embattled temple above. Goblins had begun prying at the grate on Council Boulevard, but now the temple was gone. And something worse. Something worse? Echoed fearly voices behind her. A mana cloud! A killing cloud! It's enveloped the city! Goblins stopped prying. They craned to see past the iron bars. An eerie silence came over the sewer and the streets beyond. Into the silence intruded a horrible sound. Wind moaned through the vast structure. Tiny bells sounded. Not bells, but crystals ringing against each other. The tintinabulation quickly became cacophony. Atop the high jingle came a chorus of two thousand throats screaming. The Thran temple came down through the descending ceiling of cloud. It was canted on its side. The faces of refugees flashed in the spectrum over the city. Massive and beautiful and doomed. The temple struck. It broke into a million pieces. Crystal shot out in razor shards. Implosions rocking the city. Down! Rebek yelled. Down! Descend! It's our only hope! Away from the light! Away from the white cloud! Down to the caves of the damned!